I hope that you're all having a, a really great conference, such rich, rich discussion, uh, a lot of content. I'm Deirdre Hughes, and I'm going to be chairing this next session. And this next session, I think, um, is going to, to be presented in two parts. One part which isn't actually on the program. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a very, very brief presentation um, from our colleague from the Cabinet Office, who's actually working on a Prime Minister project um, looking at diversity. And actually, it links so well with many of the discussions that we've had. So we're going to have a quick 10 minutes on diversity. I hear there's going to be a bit of interaction as well, which is fantastic. And then what we're going to do is we're going to very briefly have short just a few minute presentations from some of our panel speakers here, and then the floor will be open to you, because we're very mindful that really and truly, we want to get questions from the floor. It helps us all with our sense making from the day. So what I'd like to do is uh, just hand over really to uh, Zamila Bangwalola. That's probably not quite right, but uh, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everybody. Can I please ask you to take out your phones and your iPads and Google ethnicity, facts, and figures? And then just show me your phones when you're there so I know we can start. So, but while you're searching it, uh, this is a prime minister-led project in the cabinet office. It was launched in August 2016, and the prime minister commissioned my team to build the world's first website containing all government data broken down by ethnicity. So no other country has one of these. We built it from scratch. And so I'm just going to show you some education and employment data, because we're all in this website. It contains government data published and unpublished to date. So please just show me your phones when you're there, so I know. Wonderful, okay, let's start. So the project is called Race Disparity Audit, but the website is called Ethnicity Facts and Figures, because the data that we collect is actually by ethnicity, not race. And lots of people didn't know what the word disparity meant. So we figured we can't call it that. So the idea of the website is to be open and transparent so that anyone can access this data. So bear with me as I get used to an iPad. I'm just gonna show you the sophistication of the site and show you some of the data in it. So we worked with all government departments to build this website. It has over 130 data sets in it. And if you consider the census is one data set, you get an idea of how much data is here. We've only built about 25% of this because there's still lots more data to come. So hopefully, we're adding more data to it all the time. And the clicker doesn't want to help me. Sorry. This nice chap keeps telling me what I'm doing wrong. That helps. Thank you. All right. So we have hundreds of pages on the website like this one, but I'm just going to show you some of it. So this is reading writing maths. First of all, on each page, we tell you where the data came from, which date department published it, when it was published, and what time series it covers. We went around the country testing this before we made it public. We engaged with academics, NGOs, providers, schools, hospitals, local government, central government, devolved government. We needed to know what people wanted to access a website for and how it is they were going to navigate the tool. So it might look very bland, but that's what people asked us for. Because we spent a lot of money having very good data viz in this. And most people said they didn't actually understand strong data viz. So simple is what they asked us for. So after the provenance, we give you the main facts and figures. Because the second thing people said to us after telling us to make it simple was, please give us the main facts. Tell us what the disparities are between different groups. Don't try and hide any of that. So the top of the page after, you get the main facts and the disparities in the site. Then you get the technical information behind the things you need to know buttons. That's legal information, that's ethnic categorization information, and any suppression details. Because a lot of the academics needed to know that information in terms of methodology. But in terms of ethnic categories, by virtue of doing this project, we recognize in government, we collect ethnicity across many different levels. Some government departments collect what we call census 2011 categories, and some departments collect no ethnicity data. So it was important that we always say what the disparities are by what categories. So the first chart. Many of you probably already know that the education outcomes in the UK differ by ethnic group. What you may not know is the scale of the disparity. So you can see here, the highest education attainment group in reading, writing, maths is the Chinese population. The lowest, I have to keep scrolling, is the Gypsy Roma. And the range is over 50 percentage points. That is very significant. It is important that we recognize the scale of the disparities between our groups. But the data is better than that, so I'm just going to scroll down. 
But in addition to a ta chart, we give you a table, because a lot of people are not data numerate, so they need to see charts as well as tables. And then you get the summary of the data you just saw, but also a strong value out of the site is you can download everything. So on the right-hand side, after a chart, you can download the information. It's free of charge. Because a lot of people told us, this data may well be published in other places, but it's hard to access. And when you can't access it, you can't necessarily understand it. So we made sure that our website can be accessed and all the data can be downloaded. Then, because we know not everything in outcomes can be explained by ethnicity alone. So free school meals is the only measure we have on socioeconomic issues. However, this data tells you that even when you factor for socioeconomic groups, the disparities remain the same. The Chinese group is still the highest performing, the white other group is still the lowest performing. So it is important that we factor these issues when we look in the numbers. Again, the same format, you get the table, you get the summary and the data download, and then this is the most sexy part of my website. So this data, as I said, has always been published, but my team, for the first time, broke it down by geography. So if I want to know what is the highest achieving area in the country for the Asian group, I click the button and it tells me it's Bromley. If I want to know what it is for mixed, I click and it tells me. This is fundamental because we need to know if we're going to tackle these disparities, we need to know where they're the greatest. And we also need to be able to compare between areas so we know what's working or what isn't working. And then I'm just going to scroll you to the bottom of this page to show you right at the bottom because we have also gender because of course girls do better than boys. That is no different for ethnic minorities. Girls do better than boys. And right at the bottom, we give you the full methodology, the full download capability of that entire page, and we tell you when that data was published and when it was last updated. A website about data has to be up to date. So we are constantly adding new data to this thing. We're also updating the data. And then you get our social media linkages at the bottom too. I'm now just gonna show you one more page, if it lets me. I'm going too quickly for it, sorry. I'm going to show you work, because today you're here to talk about education and employment capabilities. Wait. Oh, this laptop doesn't like me. All right, here we go. So again, the measure page is the same format as always, as I said. Provenance of the data, main facts and figures after, and then the suppression information. And then the gaps between ethnic groups. The range is very significant. This is what we call the employment gap. For ethnic minorities compared to whites, it's double digit gap, it's about 10 percentage points. But then you have to compare it between individual ethnic groups. So you see from the church, the white group is the highest achieving, then it's the Indian, I think, yeah. And then you see Pakistani and Bangladeshi way back at 53 percentage points. If we are going to tackle this problem, we have to look at what is happening across different groups. But again, the page breaks down much further, chart and table and summary, let me keep going here. This is what we call split tables. What you need to know when you identify a problem is, is that problem getting better or worse over time? And for which group is it the same or not? So split tables allow you to look at individual ethnic groups and their time series data. In this chart, you can see all the groups are going in the right direction. They're all getting better, but they're not all getting better at the same time or the same scale. And they're coming out of recessions at different levels. Because in that time period, you have a recession and you have a dip as well as other things in the labor market. So it is important to recognize how different ethnic groups are faring in our labor market across recessions and dips. So there it is, the table over time. And academics told us they would find that very useful because academics are taking this data away to mine it and to fund more research. NGOs are taking this data away to actually just do funding proposals. So the last bit I'm going to show you, again, is gender here, and I have it by region Sorry, firstly by age. The ethnic minority population is highly youthful, so it's important to recognize for your perspective, one in three kids is ethnic minority in school. One in four students in university is an ethnic minority. 14% of the working age population is ethnic minority. I'm gonna stop there, the dear is here. But if you have questions, we'll take them after. Thank you. That's great. And isn't it wonderful that state of the art um, maybe had its first uh, public outing perhaps here. Um, so please do do use this. Um, and I think actually, Samila, it, it really chimes very well with the, the sort of theme of this last final session. Because the last final session is really all about career dialogue and these school-to-work transitions. 
Now, I had planned that I was going to say a few words myself, but I think it's more important that you get a chance to, to ask questions, etc. So, really, just to say, in your information pack, um, there is a, a, a little um, overview of this, but this session, really, is where we get a chance to uh, invite some key experts to reflect on this topic of careers policy, or careers dialogue. And really, to do that, um, I know from the audience that some of you are interested in policy. Who loves policy? Put your hand up if you love policy. Yeah, I love policy. Who loves research? Who are the researchers? Well, hey, look at the audience. More researchers than policy. And who loves practice? Yes, yeah, exactly. So we're a perfect audience. We've got representation. So look, without further ado, I'd like to just hand over, I'm going to ask Anthony to just say a few words and set in the scene around career dialogue, some uh, reflections. Then we'll move very quickly to Sue. Um, then we might stop and give you a chance, um, perhaps, uh, and then we'll go to Tristan and to, to Ellie. So off you go. Okay. Um, well, our context here is uh, school to work transitions, and, and um, the UK is a bit unusual internationally in that um, the evidence points towards school, tra school to work transitions getting um, sort of more difficult here even though this is a country, like many others, where young people are more and more educated. You know, they're, they're leaving um, education with more years of education, more qualifications than any generation ever in history. But there's, there's a few indicators. There's one which is about the um, um, comparative wages. If you look at the earnings of young people and compare them to older people and look at it over time, and you can find that you know, young people, a higher proportion of them are earning um, minimum wage or, uh, uh, or, or much lower levels, but also in terms of employment rates. So um, in the UK, there's, you can, you can, and in other countries, you can do a comparison between the, the level of youth unemployment and the level of employment for people over 24. And in the UK, you know, the, um, the comparative rate for our young people is getting, getting greater and greater. Um, and it's much more marked than in other countries, which you know, can suggest that, mm, well, there's something that's going awry here in terms of young people, you know, finishing, you know, kind of pretty highly qualified in terms of history. Um, you know, they've got lots of human capital and paper. But yeah, really struggling to find their, their kind of place in the labour market. And um, I'm interested in kind of, you know, kind of the idea of kind of career dialogue um, in terms of, well, you know, what, you know who, who is having the conversations here? You know, um, and you know, is is this about the you know kind of the broader relationship between two worlds, one of an educational setting, one of an economic setting, which we know um, are falling further and further apart? And just one final thing, which I, I'd mention, is that it's striking here that you know teenagers aren't doing part-time work anymore. You know, um, perhaps uh, you know, perhaps 20 years ago, probably at least half of teenagers, you know, 15, 16, 17 year olds, were doing part-time work alongside you know kind of full-time studies. That's not the case anymore. Mm. That's not the case, um, and it tends actually to be kids from more from middle class backgrounds who are who are doing are doing jobs. And there's a whole bunch of long, longitudinal studies which show that if you do do a part time job, a long time your full time studies, you do better as an adult because you you know you gain something from you know from that experience. Perhaps just to say, there's an international literature review on career education which Anthony and I worked on, and we can give you the link if you want to look more at the evidence on that. Okay, that's great. That gives us a really good broad context. Um, Sue, some reflections from you. Okay, um, I'll just start by very briefly introducing who I am because I'm aware I'm different from the person that you've got in the programme. So you were due to have Catherine Haller. She's our chief executive. I'm her deputy. Unfortunately, she's been called away. Um, but Deirdre's asked me to say a little about the career strategy and to try and put that in the context. I suppose I need to, to say that we are an organisation that provides career professionals and, and uh, support to schools. Um, from my perspective, I suppose the long-awaited careers strategy is um, really very much to be welcomed. And I think most particularly from a perspective of the partnership element of, of the strategy. So recognising that schools, employers and career professionals need to work together really to, to sort of solve uh, the kinds of issues that we're finding and, and help young people make robust decisions. And I think what we particularly welcome is the emphasis on leadership, systematic planning and improvement and really making sure that there are robust programs that start early um, and are impartial and to me that's a really crucial part of, of um, as we've just heard about the, the difference between education routes, academic routes and technical routes and I, I think that parity of routes is another crucial part of, of the strategy. Um, I won't say too much 
um, more about the, the positives, I probably need to throw in a few things, food for thought. So from my perspective, I suppose um, strategy is great. It's actually implementation that matters, and I'm sure everybody would agree with that. Um, I think there are a number of unanswered questions that we might want to think about, uh, one being how do schools fund the new responsibilities that have been given to them? My experience is that actually schools are buying less careers activity at the moment as pressure on budget squeezes. And I, I think you know, that's a very real problem that we need to, to think about and come up with a very real solution to. I think there's also a question about how do we get the right or the, the best opportunities to the most vulnerable and the young people that really need it most. And I was really interested in what you said about middle class young people being the ones that are tending to do the work, uh, the work experience, and how do we get those opportunities in. Um, I was at a, a very uh, nice girls school where a friend of mine teaches recently and she was organising work experience for her girls overseas. At the moment, very few state schools could, could compete with that, but I think we need to have a vision of where that might happen. Um, I think uh, we also need to ask ourselves about the sort of oversight of the career strategy. What happens if a school isn't providing what it should be providing? At the moment, there's a sort of statement that that will be dealt with as a local issue, but actually I think somehow Ofsted or another body needs to have more teeth. If, if this is really and truly going to be implemented. And to give you a context of that, we work in about 140 schools at the moment. I've got one school buying 150 days of, of career professional time and another one buying two. I'm not quite sure how that works out to a, a sort of good offer for the young people in that school. Um, I do also think there's a bit of a mismatch. Sorry, I'll hurry up, Deirdre. Uh, I think there's a bit of a mismatch sometimes between what we measure and the aspirations in the strategy. So if you look on the DfE website and you look at the performance tables for schools, for example, it will give you a whole load of data about how many young people went into higher education from that school, how many went into the top 25% of universities, how many went to the top Russell Group universities, how many went to Oxbridge, and then it says, right at the bottom, when you scroll all the way down, how many went into an apprenticeship? And I think some of those kinds of messages which we're giving need to be solved if we're really going to get parity, um, parity of, of route between technical and academic routes. Um, and then really the last thing I probably need to say, oh, actually I should also say that performance data is actually three years old as well. And if we're really going to hold schools to account and make sure that the right work is is being done, I think we need that data to be much more up to date. Um, and then two other very quick issues. Um, how do we address the very real issues of capacity in careers guidance? I think we've lost an awful lot of qualified careers practitioners over recent years. The strategy very much puts an emphasis on young people having access to guidance. We need to, to do a piece of work to make sure that we can actually meet that demand. And then finally, the one thing that I think isn't clear in the strategy is around young, neat people post-16. There's very little in the strategy that covers that group, and I would really like to see more about what those young people should be entitled to. A local authority very close to us currently has a neat and not known figure of, I think it's 48%. And if that's the case, they're not really neat, but they don't know where they are. And if that's the case, how do we get the right support to young people when they need it and indeed start to move them into the kinds of careers that we want them to move into? I think both those um, inputs actually give us lots of food for thought. I'm just really interested now in hearing what your reflections are, any questions um, you have or any reflections you know, around this whole business of careers dialogue and school to work transitions. Just say who you are. Um, that would be wonderful. And your question. Hi, my name is Alison Braithwaite. I work for Bishop Gross Test University, but I spent 25 years in connections and careers prior to that. And I just want to echo what you said, Sue, about what's happening to young people out of school, because there is, as far as I can see, a very um, postcode lottery as to what service they get. And also, currently, I work with unemployed adults. And for lots of them, it's the school to work transition that's really been missing. And I think what we're doing is setting up another generation who are going to fall through the gap. Who helps a 16, 17, 18 year old, 19 year old to navigate 
the world of work or, or opportunity awareness because there isn't really the, the, the standard support out there that you can sort of like quality assure and say that's really going to be there across across the country. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just let's take a couple more. Again, the gentleman here and then the lady just behind. That's you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, I just... Uh, I'd, I'd just like to say something really optimistic about the situation in schools because I agree with a lot of what was said there uh, and I worry also about sustainability of, uh, of a lot of the initiatives that are happening like the hubs and things like that which are great you know as a start but they're not they're not sustainable but I, I work sorry Brian Lightman uh, I currently work as a freelance consultant going into a lot of schools and supporting lots of schools in various capacities and I'm seeing a sea change in the in the way they are approaching uh, careers now, the ho in the widest sense, that schools are really committed to creating a coherent strategy and pull together the things that they were doing, perhaps that were bits and pieces. Uh, and, and I see that as a really, really positive thing. So I think we need to hang on to that and let them build on that and, and accept that this career strategy has only just been published and that we are moving. But there are real issues about sustainability and the, and the real elephant in the room is the one about funding because uh, you cannot expect them, you know, uh, great to have a careers leader, love the role, uh, and I'm, I should have said as well, I'm on the board of the Careers and Enterprise Company and I, I, I think the, the, the role is a really important one, but who's gonna pay to put that in, in place when you haven't even got enough money to appoint maths teachers? Thank you. Now this is very much a reflection uh, session and also we're going to have two more inputs. Um, I'm going to come back to the, the lady in just a second, but I'm, I'm very mindful this is an international conference as well, so we don't want to get too bogged down in England uh, with the greatest of respect um, to all those involved in uh, the English uh, policy uh, development. So please, um, if you're from another country, you know, please do share your reflections on this. You know, what's going on in your country around careers dialogue, particularly on that school to, to work transitions? We'll be keen to hear from you. And we've got a bit of time now. We can have this uh, discussion. I'm going to take one more question here, and then I'm going to, um, to go to Tristan, who will give us some reflections. Hi, this is a Carol Teacher from Class of Your Own. And it's really just a, a reflection, as you're talking about the difficulty, the increasing difficulty of of school to work transitions. I was trying to reflect on why that might be and reflecting back to my, my past. Um, and looking at the programs uh, that go into schools, I'm amazed at the amount of work that teachers and schools do to help the emotional well-being of their children in something that we didn't have before. And I, and I can imagine if they're used to that kind of um, help and support, the workplace doesn't give it to them. And maybe that's something to do with it as well, the, the, the fact that we're expecting schools to provide all of that um, as well as uh, teaching them as well. So. Yeah. So it, it, like, there's an awful lot of ask of schools. And I think this is one of the, the really big challenges is that the more and more that gets piled on to schools, then it, there is a point where uh, there has to be some clarity as to how, as the resource matching that. Um. Um, did you, can I just quickly come in before? Yeah, please. Just, just on this, um, a couple of years ago, we, we asked, when I worked here, we asked um, nearly 2,000 um, 19 to 24 year olds what they thought about their school to work transitions and what they wish they'd had more of while they were at school. And it's, uh, the report's called Contemporary Transitions, and it's, it's, um, I saw a copy outside. Um, um, and what they said was, in pretty big numbers, was that you know, they, 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 they wanted some really practical support about recruitment processes about, you know, I mean, how do you interview, you know, how do you put together a good application, how do you, you know, how do you present yourself, well, you know, kind of really, you know, kind of really practical stuff, but also they're very curious about um, what this world of work is really like and, you know, how can they, you know, get, you know, information about, um, uh, you know, whether opportunities might be right for them or not. It felt there was such a wall, and I think the thing is that they're really aware of this, and looking back, you know, in quite big numbers, they're saying, we wish we'd had more of this. And, you know, in, in, in that study, we, we kind of did one of our tests to see if you, if you had um, a, lot of, a lot of engagement, did it make a difference? And it did make it a difference um, because we think that's kind of the very practical sort of like stuff, which, is, um, which really, does, um, really does pay off. Great. Um, let's just hear from Tristan, and then I'm going to go to the lady from Australia. Um, I have psychic powers. I know the countries that you all represent. <laughs> Okay, okay, yeah, um, I think 
I mean, it's very tempting at these conferences to focus on all the things that are wrong, isn't it? And, and, and particularly for people with sort of longer memories to say, oh, well, you know, we had TBI and we had diplomas and we have had all these other things. I think there are some elements in England that are quite positive at the moment, or at least give us some sort of foundation on which, which we can build. And so, you know, we, we have an apprenticeship system. We have the, the, the introduction of the levy. Of course, there are many issues with it, but there are also some, some positive things there. There is, um, you know, the T levels coming and, and so on. So there are, I think there are some things which are, you know, far from perfect, but which uh, give us a public uh, forum for discussion about vocational education that we haven't had uh, for a while at least. And I think on the careers bit, which is where I mainly work, there are, I mean, as Brian said, there are many issues in terms of the implementation but we have, in GATS, the Gatsby benchmarks, we have a very clear framework which schools are actually working with. We have a, an organization in, in Prison Enterprise where I work that has, that has some kind of role in bringing it all together and giving some sort of coherence. So I, I think there are lots of positive things that we can build on. And I think one of the things we need to do to make sure that we do going forward is that we stabilize this system rather than keeping to kind of keeping changing it, which has been one of the problems. And I've just done a bit of work on, on the so-called fourth industrial revolution. And I've looked at, uh, at reports written all over the world and everyone's basically having the same conversation. If you look at in, in other countries, there's lots of people talking about VET, there's lots of people talking about careers and transitions and so on. And I think we all, I mean, going back to what Kevin Orr said at the beginning, I think we should be quite careful about piling endless policy objectives on top of vocational education and on top of careers. Um, these things are worth doing in their own right they do have other policy benefits, but, but I think we shouldn't expect them to perform uh, tasks. You know, we shouldn't expect that a good, good career guidance can deliver social equality where, when it's, you know, that is bound up with many, many other problems. I think Deirdre's um, framing around dialogue is very helpful. And one of the things that I, I think I feel about uh, education is that education is in a dialectical relationship with society. It's not, it, it, it can't, it's not just an instrumental way in which you achieve an aim. We, we, we put some uh, money into education and therefore we get more apprentices and therefore you know, all social problems vanish. I think education is something which is in dialogue with society, with politics. It's about making people think and about changing how they behave. And if it's not doing that, then it's not doing anything really that's worth doing. And so I, I've, I've tried to think about this quite a lot in terms of career guidance. But I think these questions uh, that I, th I think are the sort of basic dialogue that you're having when you're having career guidance are actually relevant much more widely in education as well, which is I think the dialogue that we're having with people through education is the, que the questions will be, well, who am I? How does the world work? Where do I fit into the world? How can I live with others in the world? And how do I go about changing the world? And if, if we were able to, to reframe the dialogue in that way, then, then it's possible for education to start to play some of the bigger roles that, that, it, it, that people have been asking it to play. But that, that assumes that we put education in a, in a position where we recognize that it is not just achieving sort of very instrumental aims. It's also engaging people and asking them to think critically about the world that we live in. Thank you, Tristan. Let's just have some uh, reflections um, from Ellie. Okay, so I'm coming from a different angle to this. I mean, I've done so much work with Anthony in the past eight years in the secondary uh, area, and it's fascinating because we provided so much evidence, we incited in career strategy, and we're very proud of that. But then we did launch a video called Redraw the Balance, as some of you might have seen it, and it showed really interestingly that how kids in the primary school where we asked them to draw something uh, about who they want to become in the future they all showed clear gender stereotypical views about who they want to become in the future so that actually struck us so much that we wanted to, to repeat that in a wider scale so we did a report called drawing the future which was picked up by national media internationally and we actually presented our world economic forum and it showed clear patterns of gender stereotyping in the jobs that kids want to become in the future. 
And that's where we started putting that into context and looking at other projects in literature, such as Aspire Project by King's College and now UCL and other literature that shows uh, that primary school and earlier experiences are are as important as the secondary. So sometimes even more because if we leave things in the, uh, to the last minute, when in secondary in year 12, mindsets and attitudes and aspirations are already shaped. And it will be very difficult considering the, the, the load of information on young people uh, about their, the, 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 the subjects they want to study, uh, the, the, the exam results, uh, and the expectation from the employers coming to their doorsteps, work ready, it's all very last minute. So I think what our research is starting to show, uh, and it's, it's backed up by other people's uh, literature and, and research, that we need to start in primary if we are serious about making changes in uh, aspirations and horiz broadening horizons and, and changing things. So the, 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 the research that we... Um, launch yesterday actually showed for the first time that teachers agreed with us and more than 50 percent of the people who responded to our survey yesterday they said that actually creates learning about jobs actually maybe not a right word to use careers in primary because that i made a lot of people angry uh, but uh, it seems like to, to, to me that teachers want and believe that we need to start from very early age and help children to see the possible um, uh, opportunities ahead of them, who they can become, what are the pathways in front of them, and learn about the skills, information, and knowledge that can help them make those informed choices about their futures later on when they, 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 they get to secondary. So that's what I wanted to, to cover today, and happy to take questions about the research. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back. Thank you, Ellie. That was really excellent. I'm going to get you to think now about at what age should career dialogue actually begin for young people um, uh, so that they can learn about the world of work? Uh, how many people agree that it should happen in primary? Anyone feel that maybe that's not the case? No? Do you? Well, I think there's a great debate, isn't there, around, you know, again, resources and stretch and how that's done and managed. And Ellie's um, currently undertaking two other pieces of, of research on this topic, which I'm involved in with her. So if you want to know anything about the research on primary, Ellie's the person to go to. Um, the lady from Australia, I'm sorry, I've kept you waiting for a while, but is there any question you want to, to ask uh, just on reflections and what we've heard on the wider topics, not just uh, primary? <laughs> Thanks so much. And it isn't anything terribly exciting. I was just responding, really, that um, in Australia we hear so many of the same debates, and so even though we're talking about an English context, it really is so useful. And I think that, um, uh, apart from the academic work I do, as one of my roles is I work on the Australian National Career Service, mm -hmm. um, which and uh, Australia it has a complex system of each state runs its own system and then a federal system and then we have three school sectors so we have lots of fun with different um, systems but I think one of the focuses certainly for the kind of the education center um, that I work in is to provide resources for the school teachers um, in a lot of different modes and mediums so things like we've got a new framework called preparing secondary students for work um, which is both vocational and careers arms um, and then also we have um, in years nine and ten in the national curriculum we have careers um, information which we really would like to be able to extend um, into into primary and certainly upper primary mm. so that was That's this very, really report very. from very interesting because sometimes you know we can be very insular around you know we're so excited about having a strategy in England that um, it's really really important for us to look at the wider evidence base as well I suppose one of the big questions that I um, have been reflecting on um, is you know do we believe that we need a national careers service uh, all age service or indeed you know are we in a time and a place now where actually devolution let people make up their own local career strategies and work for local people. Anyone want to respond to that around a, a national career service? Well, some of you I know are part of a national career service. Yeah, thank you. Can I just say who you are? Hi, my name's Rosie Neffer. I'm here from Dorset. Um, 
The bit that um, uh, is occurring to me when we're talking is that we've talked a lot about schools and college responsibility, education responsibility. We've talked a lot about um, young people and about the information they receive. But of course, we um, all know that parents are a major influence. Um, and the bit that um, I keep reflecting on is about who talks to parents, who tells parents, not tells parents when they should be thinking about things, but um, I, I try to be a good parent, but I'm not always on top of everything. And sometimes the school has to remind me to pay a bill or to remind me that I need to make a choice about something. Um, who's, who's reminding parents or kind of prompting parents to have they start thinking about things and, and when and the appropriateness of that conversation? I think that's really very interesting. If you look at some international examples in Singapore or in the Philippines, actually parents are very much the focus of career education and, and guidance. Um, so it's a very good question. Does anyone in the panel want to respond to that? Any exciting developments that you're aware of when it Could comes I, to parents? Just, just very quickly, which is actually something that we're doing in, our, in my own organisation, which is um, piloting exactly that. So piloting a programme for parents, um, the first of which is with parents on their own, and that talks about, um, in effect, I suppose, the, the sort of behaviours that might be appropriate in terms of supporting your child so trying to deal with those parents that maybe have aspirations for their child which aren't in keeping with the child's or um, maybe parents who actually are completely disengaged from the process so we the first session is around that and then subsequently three sessions which work with the parent and the young person together to try and work through things like the range of choices that they have to think about that young person and what might be appropriate and then to tie it all up at the end. So that's very much in early days, but I think you're right. And I think um, interesting with the discussion about things like gender stereotyping, you know, there's quite a lot of research that parents are one of the major sources of the gender stereotyping that, that creeps in even at primary age. So, you know, I think that's part of what's driving our thought that we need to do something specifically with that group. Can I just come in? Oh, oh, so one of my PhD students is working on parental involvement in careers, education and guidance. And uh, she's from the Netherlands. And they've brought in, uh, they, they, they created a, a sort of twilight sessions, after school sessions, where they brought parents in. And it was basic stuff. It was helping parents to get their heads around, well, how do we make university choices and what's an apprenticeship, and that, that kind of stuff. And um, she found that it was, I mean, they found that it was very effective. It worked particularly for parents who didn't have a lot of knowledge of the educational system, so people who were first, uh, first uh, generation going to university and so on. What she also found, which is less promising, is that the schools found it very difficult to maintain that over the long run. So a, a project they could run, it worked well, but the long-term ability of secondary schools to be able to interface with the community and with parents was, was something that they really struggled with. And so a lot of those things dried up when the funding went away. So, but yeah, so there is some evidence. And there have been many other things across, across the world where people have tried that sort of thing. But they tend to come and go with project funding. But it certainly gives us good for thought. The gentleman at the front here. Hello, my name's uh, Peter from uh, the South East Midlands Local Enterprise Partnership. I'd like to pick up on what Tristan was saying about um, not, con not um, focusing on the negatives and, and looking at the positives. From my point of view, I left education in 1978. I had three desires in my career, all of which failed, and I also failed my A-levels. And on reflection, um, when I found out why, it was because I didn't have any careers advice at that stage. I had no employer encounters. And that was the main reason that I failed in everything I wanted to do. Um, which brings me on to the question I've got for the panel, which is that the career strategy and the statutory guidance, which are very, very positive and absolutely marvellous, because a lot of schools are doing a lot of marvellous things at the moment, um, just not enough of them. And do you think there was an opportunity missed when the language in the careers... Um, strategy and in the statutory guidance still focused on should mm. rather than must 
Who would like to take that question? <laughs> for Christian, so okay. <laughs> um, if you want, if you want to get schools or probably anyone to do things, um, then you either have to have big, good carrots or good sticks, don't you? I think at the moment we're trying with the carrots, aren't we? Really? Um, whether whether that I mean I presented yesterday and, as, and it seems what I argue is it seems that we are making some progress on it. Is that far enough or fast enough? You know, probably not so far. There's probably more, more we need to do. Whether the best way to do that is to put a lot more expectations on schools, given some of the things that people have raised about, uh, about the kind of stretch of school budgets and so on. I'm not sure that that is the right thing to do right at the moment. And I also think whatever we think, this government is not a government that's very keen on putting new formal expectations on schools around things like careers. So. Um, I, I think we're, we're working within the system. I think the, the new the career strategy and the statutory guidance that came out after it was a big step forward. It gives us a much, much clearer direction of travel, and it, and it has been interpreted by schools and, and engaged with by schools very, very seriously, I think. And I, I, I suppose I would feel like, let's see how we go over the next couple of years before we start introducing a lot more uh, sort of formal requirements. Ellie, did you want to say? So I really agree with you. And something that I've been hearing a lot from teachers when I go to conferences and seminars is that there's no accountability issue for the careers education in, in, in the UK. But from my point of view, the, the instability in the policy is actually creating a lot of problems as well. One government comes and put emphasis on it, another government comes and, and just, you know, scrap everything. And then people get confused, young people get confused, teachers get confused, and things are constantly changing. So that actually causes a lot of problems. And then obviously there's an accountability issue as well, I think. That could be tested by Ofsted maybe, but it's a personal uh, view. Perhaps also just, just to, to remind everyone that often when people talk about careers and they refer to the UK, always remember that these are separate systems. Scotland has a very well established, internationally renowned system uh, for its uh, careers and skills support. In Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland civil servants run the career service. Can you imagine that here in England? Uh, the careers advisors are professionally trained, employed by them, but they've hooked up with the Department for Economy and the Department in, uh, of Education, and they have a joint statement uh, and a, a joint vision, and they have an employer-led strategic advisory group. And again, Wales have got uh, their national system as well. So I hope that from this conference, you will start to sort of be more curious, hopefully, around the different systems that operate in different countries, because it does actually, we can beg, borrow, and steal from the very best that's there, including the very best that's in the career strategy. Now, I'm going to have to bring this to a close and invite Ollie in a minute, but I've got a killer question, if I'm allowed to ask a killer, killer question for our, our colleagues. So first of all, this is the killer question. Has the policy pendulum swung too far when it comes to expecting employers and teachers and mentors and volunteers to revolutionize career dialogue and school to work transitions? Has the policy pendulum swung too far? Anthony, what's your thoughts on this one? Has it swung too far? Mm. Um, I suppose, with what direction is it swinging in? Um, is it swinging in a, a more voluntarist direction? I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, I mean, I, I would say probably yes, it, it's, um, it, it appears that it is too far um, in a voluntarist term. Um, it, it's, I mean, the, the work that I've done over the years and many other people have has shown that you know, these interventions are, are, are really important, they're very meaningful, and they have, um, um, I think we have a growing, a growing sense and understanding about what works, why it works, how it works. And you know, then it becomes, um, I suppose, a matter of um, surprise, perhaps, you know, if um, something's a should rather than a must. Okay, great. Now, because of time, can I just get our panelists and um, why not all of us contribute on the panel? Yes or no, has the policy pendulum swung too far? I, I personally don't think it has. 
No, um, okay. I won't say more. Okay. <laughs> I actually just came from a conference between Universities UK and the National Union of Students, where we were talking about the outcomes for young people from the university sector and how students are helped into the system is a big problem in terms of how many kids today, while we appreciate lots of kids going to university, are they choosing the right courses? Are they then getting jobs? Are they then getting the right jobs? What pay gaps are they achieving? And then it comes back to what are we not doing in schools that is help enabling these kids not to go into the right courses and then get the right jobs? So there's definitely something that is still missing in our system that says we are not helping kids either through schools or into universities, or then from there into the labor market. So it's, a, it's not just a pendulum swing, it's how long that duration of the gap is going to last. Um, I'm very comfortable with the vision that's set out in the Gatsby Benchmarks, which says we need teachers to be doing things, we need professional careers advisors, we need employers, we need people from various kinds of post-compulsory learning. All of these people need to be mobilized in order to give young people the best opportunities to form and think about their careers. I think the thing that we've added in more recently, which makes even more sense of that, is the idea of the careers leader as a kind of professionalized role within, within schools who can help to coordinate and pull all of, all of that stuff together. Um, so I definitely don't think it's helpful to set it up as a, as a framing between do we need uh, careers professionals or employers? We clearly need both at all and more, but we also need some coordination to pull it together. Yeah, thank you. And Ellie? So I'm not a, really a policy person, I'm more of a researcher, but I, I'm, I'm pro doing everything together and doing it collectively. So we need a lot of employers, a lot of efforts by teachers, and uh, w there is a coordination to be done here by a lot yeah. of organisations. Well, what a wonderful way to end this session now, um, because uh, partnerships, doing things together, maximising the resources, and what I've found most um, effective when it comes to career dialogue is find other people who've got vision and drive and will bring about the change that's needed. Now, I'd like to hand over to Ollie, uh, who's just going to give us our final closing address. But thank you very much and a round of applause for our contributors. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for another really great session. Um, it's been a really excellent couple of days, so thank you so much. Um, don't worry, I'll keep this short, and I promise you'll be out uh, in the next 10 minutes. So, um, first of all, just a big thank you. Um, so, thank you to our partners, my colleagues at EDGE, uh, colleagues at Education Employers, um, colleagues at the Commercial Education Trust, at the Centre for uh, Vocational Education Research, and at the Careers and Enterprise Company. And it's great to be hosting the conference here um, at the Business Department as well. I really just wanted to pick up two themes quickly to, to close. Um, the first of them is that it's been really lovely to see uh, the way that our kind of community of researchers and practitioners has come together over the last couple of days, um, both in the kind of questions and the discussion that we've had in the sessions, but kind of equally importantly um, in the discussions that have been happening outside as well. Um, that's brilliant. It's been a really kind of positive atmosphere, really kind of positive vibe to it, which is great. But these sessions can only really happen every couple of years, and I feel like we should be doing more in between to make sure that we're kind of keeping up that community. Um, both to test ideas, um, to make sure that we manage any overlap in our research, um, to share lessons uh, that are kind of coming up again and again to increase our voice, um, and to support kind of the growth and, and, uh, of researchers in this area uh, in the future. I'm really pleased that since the last conference, we've already kicked off some really exciting work there. So uh, we have a research review group which now has over 50 members um, uh, looking at uh, this work, making connections. If people would like to join that or, or be, uh, kind of have more information, then they would be more than welcome. Um, that's been a really useful vehicle to do things like co-funding research projects, which otherwise might not have happened. Uh, one of the ones we heard about uh, yesterday, one of the sessions I was in, uh, a piece of work looking at the different countries of the UK, which as Deirdre rightly says, are all very different and provide us with a bit of a test lab. Uh, and we did that in partnership with the Institute of Education. We've also uh, developed an early career researchers network, so supporting people who are in their PhD or, or finishing their PhD and going into early areas of uh, career research. Um, and it was fantastic to see a couple of our uh, members presenting brilliantly um, over the course of the last couple of days. We're hugely proud of them um, and to others who've made their first conference presentation here. Um, uh, there's uh, bursaries on our website that are funded jointly by EDGE and by education employers uh, to help support people who are doing their, their kind of first steps in research uh, to present. So we would love to kind of do more of that to make sure that we keep this kind of community atmosphere alive, not just at these events every couple of years, but in the meantime as well. And I think that's something to, to kind of take away. The other point I wanted to make was about kind of making our voices heard. So it feels like 
we've heard really consistent messages, actually, both from presenters who come from the English context and from the fantastic presenters who've come from international context um, over the last few days. You'll have your own ideas about the kind of messages that you've heard and that are really stuck in your heads. But a few of the ones that really came across to me, this idea of focusing on skills and competencies for the future, the whole area of kind of the fourth industrial revolution, skills 4.0 has come up again and again, and quite rightly so. The importance of employer engagement and of high quality careers advice, as we've just heard in the last session. And also this point about the need to think broader and be more imaginative than perhaps the kind of traditional curriculum approach. So how can it be that we've had kind of 200 really uh, leading lights in education research from England and abroad right here in the basement of a government department, um, and yet that hasn't really filtered through in some of the government thinking? Well, I think one of the challenges, uh, and, and I guess a confession to start with, so I spent 12 years in the civil service in the education department and here in business. Um, I don't think I ever read a research report cover to cover in that, in that time period. And that's partly because the, the pressure of work is so high um, and you're kind of constantly trying to meet ministers' expectations. But it's also because uh, there's a kind of strong reliance, I suppose, from policy civil servants and those making policy um, on the analytical community within government to kind of uh, be the filter and, and, and support them to, to kind of understand the research base out there. Um, I think one thing we can all do is try and make that connection much more explicit. Um, it was lovely. I bumped into, uh, I think he's probably headed off now, but one of my colleagues who uh, works in the civil service up in Sheffield who'd come down to the conference. But I think we only had one or two civil servants here, despite making this kind of available to, to, to people in the department. So um, I think there's a real kind of uh, importance of us making our voice heard with, um, with, with civil servants. Um, secondly, tongue in cheek, um, I have a thesis that's been developing over the last couple of days. Um, I'm thinking of leaving EDGE to pursue my PhD. So let me, let me run the main thesis by you and see if you think it's sensible. Um, so my, my starting point is um, Nick Gibb, the Minister for, Skill, uh, for, for Education, uh, was educated at a private school in the 1960s and 1970s. That leads on to my second point. So Nick Gibb learned a very traditional academic curriculum. Third point, Nick Gibb became the Minister of State for, Skills, for, for Schools. So here's my hypothesis, and you can see whether you think it's sensible or not. Um, if we were to teach all young people the, the academic curriculum of a private school in the 1960s and 70s, every young person in England would become schools minister. So if anyone would like to fund that piece of research, then please come and see me afterwards. But the, the kind of underlying point, I guess, um, is, you know, I think it's, a, it's an obvious temptation for ministers in this area to, uh, to look to their own background rather than to look to the evidence base when they're thinking about the education system and to try and create a school system, a university system um, that, that somehow kind of replicates what's happened to them. They'll all be successful because they're successful people who've made it to the top of their game. Um, uh, but it's not always the right answer for everyone to try and replicate uh, the system that they came through. So I guess the point I'd finish on is we absolutely, as a research community, have to remain in politically impartial, we have to remain neutral, we have to remain balanced, but we have to remain also champions of what the evidence says uh, and uh, kind of use our collective voice and the strength of that voice um, to make it clear when uh, decisions are being made uh, that, that aren't supported by evidence um, or, or that the evidence kind of points in a different direction. So it's been an absolute pleasure. I think Nick just wanted to join me on stage just to say thank you and, uh, and bid you farewell for a lovely weekend.